Um, welcome, everybody. Um, as as has been mentioned, it's pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of, of of craziness going on under the covers, and the things that are happening under the covers, you'll you'll see very familiar. Because if you've worked with SQL Server, you've done two SQL statements, you will find a lot, a lot of what we're doing here very similar. So let's go ahead and get on a little bit about who I am. I'm Warren Seifert with uh, Allegiant. I'm a data analytics solutions architect. Um, I've been with them now for about two and a half years and, and loving it. Um, me personally, I've been in the industry since 98. Love solutions. I love architecture. I love problems. Um, someone says I can't do it. That's a challenge. I, I love it. That's when I start hopping on that, that, that boat of mine and start rolling on through. Um, I love technology in general, so I'm not only a SQL Server fan, but I'm also a Hadoop, a Mongo, a Python, a C Sharp, a PowerShell, and information security. Those are all things that are just interests of mine that I just have a passion for. Um, I'm a past uh, chapter leader as well, do a lot of SQL Saturdays, and got a whole bunch of letters out to my name from a certification perspective. So what are we doing today? We're going to kind of talk a little bit about what is streaming analytics and what's, what's the big deal about it, right? Um, how does it work? Talk about some use cases. And then let's go into the actual configuration dependencies. This, this, this acronym of SAQL, which is Streaming Analytics Query Language, and then an actual demo and show you all this actually functioning. Um, so the, the goal here is that by the end of this presentation, you should have a good fundamental understanding of what are, what are the, how this can be used by an organization what are the dependencies and the ways that this can be implemented? And of course, what, what, what's the effort involved in getting that to work? So to start to solve, let's kick off the typical environment, right? Right now, the traditional environment, we have web applications in the cloud, you have on-premise applications, you have a variety of ETL or ELT processes that eventually bring data into a data warehouse or data mart in some way. Then some kind of semantic layer exists, and then you have your reporting visualizations. This is your traditional analytical environment, which unfortunately many organizations are still trying to get to this point. But those that have achieved this are now obviously asking the question is, how can I get my data faster? I want to get these insights sooner. I don't want to wait the 24 hours or the four hours or the one hour that it takes for data to make its way from the source application through the data warehouse and ultimately to the semantic layer and then eventually to reports or dashboards. I want to be as close to real time as possible. So with that in mind, that brings up a number of challenges, right? Uh, to be able to do that, the concept of real time analytics, at the moment there are many steps between source and data. As outlined in this document, in this, in this uh, slide here, you know, we have this warehouse in between. We have this ETL process. We've probably got some kind of staging database and some kind of cleansing and all kinds of, uh, of logic that's going into this, this effort to bring this data into the semantic layer to eventually make it available for reporting. So if you want to have real-time analytics, you're going to have to find a way to speed all of that up. And, you know, that's one challenge, right? How do we make things go faster in that point? to eventually give you the output that you want in a timely manner. But as you do that, right, let's just say you solve that challenge, right, you get, you develop an ETL process that loads stuff every five minutes. Now you start talking about scalability. That five minutes is today. Let's say you double or triple the amount of data that's coming in and you still want that level of performance. Now you're going to have to determine what is the infrastructure resource cost and the environmental scalability uh, component that you need to make sure that you can maintain that expectation that you just set, which is that five minute window. I want my data as early as, you know, as, as no later than five minutes from when it happened. It's a very challenging approach to do that. And then of course, let's talk about disaster recovery, right? You know, just because the data center went down, doesn't mean that I should be without my operational reports that my plant or my logistical infrastructure, my business unit, depends on. So now you have all these disaster recovery strategies that you're going to have to try and meet, which means even more resource costs, more environment scalability, and more considerations in trying to maintain that service level agreement that you set between you and the organization that, depending on this information, to make sure that you maintain that throughout any crisis, whether it be normal operations or, you know what, tornado took out your data center. 
or there's a rolling patch update that uh, you know that's happening. So those are some of the challenges that that are encountered when the desire to have data in a more real-time fashion starts becoming a business normal, right? It's something that organizations want. So exactly what is streaming analytics? It's a way to evaluate data before it's reached its final repository destination. So let's use the analogy of a of, of, of a toll booth, right? You want to know how many cars, how many red cars are going across this bridge. You can put a camera there and have the camera record the information for 24 hours and then have someone review that camera footage and count how many red cars went through that footage and eventually give you that information. Or you can have someone with a little counter and just start picking one red car, two, three red cars, four red cars, five, six red cars, seven red cars, eight red cars. As the cars pass by, the color is evaluated and the information is made available at that moment in time that it happens and made available and presented to some, something on the presentation layer. In my demo today, I'm going to use Power BI. So why is streaming analytics so, so necessary? I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of obviousness to this, but I'm going to repeat it anyways. You know, right now, hours of the week can be the time it takes for data to be transmitted and received, processed, aggregated, and then visualized in a traditional data warehouse architecture. This slide that I showed earlier right here can take a good amount of time. And depending on the infrastructure investment that you're willing to make will determine what that time looks like. But business requirements have changed, right? Organizations are no longer happy with just getting, hey, this is what happened yesterday. This is what happened a month ago. They want to know what happened five minutes ago. So they can do more targeted, more reactionary type of responses, especially in business organ in, in, in in lines of business that can leverage that level of insights. Okay? So it's no longer going to be something that it'd be nice to have. It's actually becoming a requirement to stay competitive in today's market space. That is why streaming analytics exists. So let's talk a little bit about how it can work, right? Um, I use the toll booth analogy. I'm going to switch back to more practical senses, right? You have a sensor. You have something happening. In my demonstration, I have an application that I borrowed from Microsoft that they have available that I've recoded a little bit so that it presents the data the way I want it to. And what it's generating is telecommunication data at random. So imagine you're a cell tower or imagine you are just uh, you know, a, a sensor of some kind and you need to get that data off of your system and available for something else to consume. So our first step is taking data from this sensor and in this case, we're using the Azure stack, so we're going to be putting inside of Event Hub or an IoT Hub. So either of those two can be, can be used as a source, as a, as a landing spot for this type of information. Uh, Event Hub is basically a message a service bus or a queue that is tuned specifically to ingest messages and data as quickly as possible. The IoT Hub does the same thing with one distinct difference. The IoT Hub allows for millions of devices to concurrently deliver content to that specific, to that specific hub, right? The, the, the Event Hub allows up to thousands, but it doesn't have a high level of concurrency. So depending on which one you use will determine what your use case is, but ultimately they both play the same role. It's a collection. Right? It collects the information that's been transmitted by these sensors and devices, and it lands in this hub. So now what's going to happen is we're going to use a streaming analytics job. Think of it as a SQL agent job, right? It runs on a schedule at a timer. You can tell it to run at a particular interval, pull data, and it actually aggregates data, allows me to write a, a SQL-like statement in there to perform some aggregations, to perform some case statements, some groupings if I want to, and then and eventually choose where I want this this newly formed information, this transformed information, where do I want to want it to land? In this slide deck here, I have Power BI, and I'm also having it land in Azure SQL database that's out there. But then again, just imagine it lands in the Azure SQL database, then you've got a, a data factory coming in, and then you have data factory kicking off some machine learning, maybe some Hadoop to do some more cleanup, right? So just imagine the daisy chain that can happen, but the goal here is, is that the streaming analytics job reads the information from this event hub 
and then distributes it accordingly to the various output points that it's configured to use. So the reimagined environment, right? So let's take that original environment we kind of talked about, and let's throw streaming analytics in the mix. And let's say the only part we're really concerned with is the web applications, right? We have a web application where we want to kind of keep track of traffic, we want to keep track of activity, right, sentiment, we want to understand what's going on out there. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this web application instead of prior being, at, you know, uh, having data pulled through an ETL or ELT process, we're going to have this application actually transmit data to the event hub. The event hub is then going to just store data. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything else. It just holds data. When the streaming analytics job reads the information within this event hub, the data still exists inside this event hub. So another process or another application or another streaming analytics job that maybe is doing a completely different set of logic against the same data set that's in this hub can leverage the same information. But now that the information has been read by the streaming analytics job, whatever aggregation has happened, we can now transmit it to a Power BI dashboard and eventually push it down through maybe data factory into an enterprise data work on premise. And then the rest of the organization and the rest of the reporting that takes place is still there. But you now have this real-time capability that didn't exist before. So some use cases, right? Transportation. Um, right now, your car, right? Uh, a lot of our most modern cars will tell us our oil life. You got 80% left, 25% left, 30% left. Before that sensor and that reading was available, we used to go on the rule of thumb, right? And change your oil over 3,000 miles to 6,000 miles, depending on whether you're doing synthetic or how hard you're running your engine. So it's a lot of, you know, lick your fingers, stick it up in the air, and I think we need to go ahead and get things changed, right? Um, imagine tires, imagine struts, other maintenance on vehicles and so forth. Well, all those things now, I can imagine if sensors were put in place, and we can actually determine exactly when things should happen. In the energy market, same thing, wind turbines and power generators can be used to determine whether, you know what, whether it's cost effective to have a generator active or whether to turn it off because there's just not enough wind, right? Or manufacturing, right? Dealing with equipment and, and machines that are on the plant floor that are running your assembly line, whether it be baked goods all the way down to, you know, transmissions or engines or whatever it is that you happen to be manufacturing. Being able to make sure that your 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 process is as optimal as possible, being able to retrieve information in real time is very important to be able to maintain that level of, 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 of effectiveness. And medical devices is another area that can happen, right? You know, we have a client where they would purchase a $150,000 bulb and let it sit in a closet for a year and a half or a year, waiting for their current bulb on their current machine to die. Why? Because it's been three years since the last time they replaced it, and it's about every three years when the bulb needs to be replaced. So they have this investment, this capital investment sitting on a shelf, sitting there, instead of the money being used in other ways. Why? Because they're waiting for it to break. What if the machine were to be able to tell us through its logs that, you know what, instead of being three years since the last change, it's been three years of work that's actually transpired over four and a half years of physical time that now necessitates the need to change that bulb or have one on standby and ready to go. So now you've just been able to shift your funds and capital in a very different way. And obviously this can, this can play a role in a variety of market spaces and a variety of industries. But these are just some use cases where streaming analytics has been leveraged and, and it's, it's, showing, it's showing a lot of value. So let's talk a little bit about some of the configuration options within the streaming analytics world. So for streaming analytics, as, the, as, as this slide here kind of shows, right, you've got inputs coming in and you have outputs going out, and something inside that yellow triangle is doing some logic. Well, same concept here, right? We have inputs, and we have a choice of inputs, and there's two different types of inputs that we can have. There's what's called a data stream, and then there's what's called a reference data. For data stream, we can use an event hub, an IoT hub, as I've mentioned before, or even blob storage. As a reference data, that is a blob storage. The difference between these two is consider your data stream being your fact table and imagine your reference data being a dimension table, right? 
So let's say you've got data coming from a sensor, and the sensor is just giving you code numbers. And what you want to do is you want to translate those code numbers into actual names, so that instead of being one, two, three, eight, five, six, seven, two, three, it is high, low, you know, middle or A, B, C instead. Something more representative to the human to be able to decipher exactly what that is. So this reference tables act like dimension tables and our data stream acts like a fact. Then we have our query section where we have the streaming analytics query language where it's similar to C SQL. This is where we take this fact, we take this dimension and just like you would in any other dimensional model, right, you would create a relationship. You would do a join or you would do any aggregations, right? You do sum and group buys and a variety of things. And there's some new functions that are specific to streaming analytics query language that deal with when doing. And we'll go into that here in a little bit. And then we have our outputs. So one streaming analytics job can push the same data set or a transformed version of that data set to a variety of outputs, whether it be a SQL database, in this case an Azure SQL database, or a blob storage, event hub. Power BI, as I'm going to demonstrate, table storage, service bus queue, service bus topic, document DB, and newly added over the last few months was data lake store. So there's a lot of options. And the thing is, is that believe it or not, one streaming analytics job can push to multiples of these. So today's demo, I'm going to show pushing data to a C Azure SQL database as well as pushing to Power BI. And then I'm going to modify it and add a second output or a third output in this case, that's also going to push to yet another location within the SQL database. There's some constraints around that. We'll talk about that a little bit. The fourth major option or area within the, the um, streaming analytics uh, job object are the settings. So one of the things that we need to be able to do is determine what's the scalability, right? So right now, with like anything with Azure, you're paying for cycles, you're paying for units of something, some kind of work. That unit translates into a certain amount of effort. Depending on the amount of data coming in and the amount of work that your analytics job is expected to do and the level of output that you expect it to do, you may need to tune the number of units that you have being used to process that. And that's part of the scale. Then you have exception handling. You've got this analytics job. It's like a SQL agent job. All of a sudden, it's, it stops working. What, what, what happens, right? Okay, it stopped working. What do we have to do to recover, right? If it's something that's supposed to run every hour and it's failed for the last three hours, do we have to recover things in a special way? Do we ignore the first two hours of execution that failed and just run it now? What are the steps for recovery and how do we manage that? And that's where this exception handling comes into play. Right. And when we get into a little bit more on how this actually works and how it pulls data and some of the windowing functions that I've alluded to, we can talk a little bit more how this exception handling plays a role in that. And then we have the alerts where you want to receive a notification when your, your streaming analytics job is not meeting certain performance levels, right? It's falling behind some of the SLAs that you said. Or more importantly, it's failed or one of the output sources that you're trying to push to is no longer available. Right? Because right now, let's just say I have a SQL Azure database out there, and all of a sudden that machine goes maintenance, or that database gets deleted, or the table output that I'm trying to push to, the schema changes, or something happens. I want to be notified because guess what? I forgot there was a streaming analytics job pushing stuff into it. And then we have functions. So this is a fairly new feature. Um, Microsoft's been introducing this now. It's been available since uh, last year of past summit in preview mode. And I think they made it a fully functional available GA, I think sometime in the last three, six months. And basically what it allows you to do, it allows you to use an Azure ML model or an experiment or a web service in Azure ML as a function within your T-SQL. So imagine if you were to, or in this case, your SAQL language. So imagine if you will, your standard T-SQL, right? You wanted to do a count function. You just type count parentheses and you plug in the parameter that you need to pass, close it, and it will give you a value, a result back. Same, same concept applies here with Azure ML. So imagine if you have part of your process is that not only am I retrieving data in real time, but now I want to do predictions or I want to do aggregations or clustering or some kind of grouping of this data that leverages an Azure ML model in some way 
and leverage that output of that model as part of my data set that goes to the dashboard or that goes to one of the final outputs that I choose. So that's the role of functions. The SAQL elements, you will see from here, if you just take a gander, a lot of this stuff is just normal T-SQL. You got your select, your from, your where, your group by, your havings, you've got your length, you got char index substring, you got your date part, you got your month, date add, date diff, you got your sum, count, av, right? You got your partitions, your width, partition by, over, lag, is first, collect top. Those are some those are those are somewhat different than what you normally would use. And the ones in particular that are very different and are exclusive to SAQL at this moment are these windowing extensions. So imagine, if you will, you have a sensor that's pushing information to an event hub and it's pushing, let's say, a thousand messages a second, right? It's pushing a lot of information. There's there's this concept of a window, right? When you want to do an aggregation of data that's in this event hub, do I want to pull all the information that's in the event hub and do this aggregation? Or do I want to pull only the last 10 minutes worth of information? Or only the last five minutes? Or the last five minutes from the last time I checked? Or the last five minutes from the last time something new entered or exited this event hub? So one of the properties of the event hub is that it collects information and you have to set a purge effort uh, um, uh, number, right? So are you going to keep this, 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 these messages in this event hub for three days, two days, a week, an hour? And once it reaches that time, any records that, ex that, that, meet, that break that threshold are dropped, they're removed, they're deleted, they no longer exist in the hub, can no longer be used by anything else because it no longer is in there. So even though we might be receiving new messages, there might be three days worth of messages in the event hub, we may only want to read the last five minutes worth. And this is where the windowing extensions come into play. These windowing extensions allow you to determine the method upon which you want these windows to work and what attributes and characteristics you want to apply to that window. So let's go into more details of that. So there's a tumbling window, and this one's, you know, this one should be fairly straightforward, right? Um, I set up a query, I want to retrieve data, and what I want to do is I want to retrieve data from, the, from five minutes from the last time I, from now. So my streaming analytics job runs right now. I will pull five minutes worth of data from now to five minutes ago. And what it's going to do, I told this streaming analytics job to only pull that data every five minutes. So not only am I pulling five minutes old worth of data, but I'm also only running for five minutes. So essentially what you got, you have blocks of information upon which none of that data is replicated, right? It's not read more than once. It's giving you that in this five minute window, there were three. In the five to 10 minute window, I have two. In the, 15 to 10, in the 10 to 15 minute window, I have one. In the 15 to 20 minute, I have two. So that is a tumbling window, so it tumbles. There's no overlap. Then you have a hopping window. Hopping window provides an overlap. So you choose how much time you wish to read the data for and do whatever aggregations. In this case, we'll stick with counts. And then how much overlap do you want to have? So instead of it tumbling and going from 10 minutes to another 10 minute block, it's pulling a 10 minute block every five minutes. So in 10 minute block of zero to 10, there's five. From the block of five to 15, there's three. From 10 to 20, there's three. So as you can see, there's a five minute overlap. And maybe there's some, there, there's some interest in being able to garner those aggregations in this real-time fashion to be able to provide it some kind of dashboard. And then we have this sliding window, which is, uh, which is a fairly unique piece, right? We, what we determine is we determine what is the size of the window that we want, and the concept of sliding means it is triggered whenever a record enters or exits the queue. So, Let's start from the beginning, right? We set up a 20-second sliding window, and we have a record that, go, that pops into the event hub at the 21-second mark. What happens is, because the record entered the queue, we want to know from that point in the past, in this case a 20-second window, of how many objects exist in this queue. Now at the 20, 
five second mark, we have another object that enters the queue, and guess what? We now take from the entry point of that 20 seconds ago, how many do we have? So it's no longer a five minute window or a 10 minute window. It is triggered every time a new record enters, we're going to look at 20 seconds in the past and see how many exist, how many records exist within that window of time. In this case, we now have two. Repeat that, we now have three. But this also behaves and gets triggered when records exit the queue. So now we have a record where it's no longer in our queue. It is gone. So now that triggers an event to look at 20 seconds in the future to see how many are left since the departure of this, which in this case is two. And then we have another departure. So now we only have one. But now let's say 45 seconds from now, we have a new record coming in. Well, that new record came in. We look at 20 seconds ago, there's nothing. So we have only one. So as you can see, the sliding window adds a little bit of complexity, but depending on the use case, it can provide some very unique numbers and metrics to be able to give you that, that, that insight of immediate workloads. So let's go into a demonstration. So right now what I'm going to do is I have a C-sharp application, telecode data, data, data gen. Um, it is something that's available. You can download from Microsoft as part of the streaming analytics template that they have. They do have this as a, as a uh, application that generates code. I've modified it a little bit to add some additional data points. And all it's going to do, it's going to run. It is a console app, and it's just going to generate information. So now what it's going to do, it's going to generate about 1,000 records over the next hour, and it's just going to constantly start generating new records. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my actual uh, into my look. One of my outputs is going to be is Azure SQL database. And what I want to show is I have this WS output table, and I have a variety of columns. And what I've done is I've chosen to collect everything that exists about this record and dump it into this table. And just to show you that there's no smoke and mirrors, I'm going to have five of this, and there's no records in there. So I've got my application generating sensor data. I've now shown that I have nothing in my Azure SQL database. I'm actually going to go into my Power BI and I'm going to refresh this. And this is one of my other outputs that I have. And what we're going to see when it eventually comes back is that under my streaming analytics, I have no dashboards, no reports, and no data sets. So there is nothing in play at the moment. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to head, over, head on over to my Azure portal, and I'm going to go to my streaming analytics job. I have already configured my event hub. The contents of this application, the output of this, is going to my event hub. And the only things I really had to change are these elements right here. Right? I had to make sure that I have the right event hub name, that I'm calling the right service bus connection string object, and then I'm adding the right endpoint as well as shared access key. So these are the things you would need to modify on your end to be able to basically perform the same demo that I'm performing here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Streaming Analytics. And let's take a look at the actual object. I've created one already. And all you've got to do is hit Add. And what it will do, it will eventually ask you to give me a name, give me a resource group where you want to apply it to, and a subscription that you're going to run it against. And ultimately, this is what you get. So we talked about inputs. So right now we have one input. And this input in particular just has some properties, right? What subscription am I using? So if I needed to, I can choose to pull Event Hub information from a completely different subscription. So let's say you have, you have your organization decides to push data into Event Hubs. But then you have outside vendors that want to leverage that data set, and you want them to grant them access to that. You can give them permission to be able to con communicate with your subscription, and they can go to a foreign or external subscription with the right authorization and be able to pull data from those event hubs. But you give it a service bus namespace, event hub namespace, event hub policy name, the key, 
And then what's the serialization format and the encoding that's happening? Right now I'm using JSON with UTF-8. But to add one, again, you just hit add and all you do is fill in those gaps, right? And this is where you choose the source type, right? Whether it's reference data, all of a sudden you just go straight to blob storage. But if you go to data stream, you'll have the option of being able to choose event hub, blob storage, or IoT hub. Should match exactly what I had on my presentation slide. So I'm going to go ahead and discard that because I really don't want to create a new one. And then let's talk about outputs, right? Because we want we need to have our outputs defined before we can write a query that will leverage the inputs and push data to an output. The input and outputs have to exist first. So we want to then create our outputs. Uh, there is an Azure SQL output which is translated into this WS output table. We then have a WS Power BI output, which is going to Power BI, which will eventually land, create a new data set here and, and create data there. And then I created a third one. This is for later on. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to modify this query and add a third output. So for right now, just ignore this. And just to show, that table does not exist at the moment inside this database. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the table, I'm going to run my queries, and then update my queries, and then I'm going to run the job, start and start, start and stop the job, and ultimately you'll see data populate there as well. So now we go into our query. And in the query, this is where we look like SQL, right? There's your select statement. There's your function of count. What we're doing is we're using the into clause, and we're going to push this content into one of our outputs. So in this case, even though I have a ton of columns inside of my table, so if you look at my table, I have got a lot more columns here than what I am actually referencing inside the select statement. So this is my output that I've defined, and this is my input, my WS event hub input. And just like in SQL, in T-SQL, I can use aliases. Here's my group by because I'm doing a count. And then I'm, this is that windowing function. In this case, I'm choosing a tumbling window. I'm choosing to use a window of seconds and define it as one second. So what this is going to do is every one second, this, and this streaming analytics job is going to, going to look for information. And everything that it finds, it's going to push into the output of WS Azure SQL output. And as a secondary output, this is my Power BI output, I'm choosing to do a select statement, I'm doing a count, I'm choosing to put a system timestamp, and I'm doing a case statement to where I'm changing letters to actual words. And then my output is going to WS Power BI, my source is Event Hub, and my tumbling, my group buys like anything else, and my tumbling window. One thing I will state about the tumbling window, you can only have one distinct definition of a, t of a window type in a streaming analytics job. So for example, I want my Power BI to be a tumbling window one second, but I want my SQL output to be every five minutes. You cannot put them in the same streaming analytics job. Everything in this query However many statements you have in this one analytics job, they all must share the same tumbling window uh, uh, settings. So if you wanted to pull data every one second, and you needed to pull data every 10 minutes, you would create a second stream analytics job, and you can figure that one to be sliding, tumbling, or hopping at the 10 minute interval that you need. So with this created, I'm now going to go ahead and let's see, let's move you out of the way a little bit. You down. So let's close you. Go away. Yep, you do. You want to. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and start this job. And what it's going to ask me when I start this is because this is not a brand new job, I've run this demo before, this has pre-existed over time, it's given me the option of when I start this job up, what do I, from what point in time do I want to start pulling data from? So do I want to pull everything, and basically this is a one second interval, so do I want to go back from the last time I ran to now and check every second 
from that point and pull data counts from every one of those seconds that has passed. I can also do a custom and choose exactly when I want to start from, or I just want to say, you know what, start from right now. I don't care what's happened over the last two hours, three hours. I only want to know what's happening now. And keep in mind, this is still running, so this is still populating data into our event hub. So I'm just going to choose now, I'm going to tell it to start. It's going to get queued up, and it's going to go into, this, into the Azure queue. Over at, it'll take a few seconds, and what will happen is eventually it'll start up. And what we will see is a few things, right? Once things start up, we will be able to run this query, and we'll actually start getting data appearing. And a few seconds later, within the Power BI realm, we will see a new data set appear. So right now, the job is still starting, so it hasn't fully started yet. And what we can do here is refresh the status and see how it says starting. So it'll take a few seconds. So one of the things that, that, that is very useful in all of this is that the naming convention that you use for your streaming analytics job, you may need to be creative with that, especially if you've got similar data points, data sets, but at different intervals and different types of windowing functions that you're using. You may need to come up with a naming convention that maybe articulates the windowing function applied. So I'm being impatient, and I am just constantly hitting refresh because I know the more I hit it, the faster it works. It's like running a report. You know, I hit it 30 times. One of those 30 will work. I re really think it will. And of course, the very last time I click on it, five, five seconds later, it comes up. That's because I clicked it 30 times. Same thing here. Come on, you know you want to. So let's switch over. Let's see if we got anything. Nope. I'm not being lied to. Still trying to start. Now keep in mind, streaming analytics jobs are something that's going to be persistently running, right? This is not something you're going to start and stop on a continuous basis. It is not uh, an agent job in that, fa in that fashion where it's, it's running, right? It, this is persistently running. It's just constantly checking at that interval time. And now it has a status of running. So now if I look at here, eventually, some point in time, I will start seeing some data up here. No, you want to. Come on. So let's go over some of the alerting pieces and things of that nature and the, some of the, you know, the, the input functions, right? So you want to create new functions as to where you would do it. The scale, we talked about scale. This is where you choose the streaming units, and this is the numbers that you can choose and pick. Um, you can use locale as far as what's going to be the, the, the language of choice. So this might uh, affect ordering and sorting of data. Uh, event ordering. Accept late events with the time step, the following ranges, right? Out of order events. And this kind of goes along the lines of, let's say you have a sensor that is not necessarily sending data every minute, but it sometimes sends a block of data in five minutes when it should be every minute. And now you've got all this data that lands at once instead of the increment expected. And you now have to make a decision as to how you want to order that. And then error policy, right? What do you want to do in the error? Do you want to retry? Do you want to drop? You know, we have some general properties and a variety of things. So if we go to functions, this is where if we wanted to, we can go ahead and add functions. Cannot be added while it's running. So because the job's running, it can't create anything new. And that's, you know, fairly straightforward. So let me go ahead and refresh this. And look at that. We now have uh, 1,215 rows. And this is the data that I'm pushing out. So you got a lot of nulls. These are all the columns that I'm not bothering to populate. And then this one I'm populating and a few others. And this is just going to continue. So I got 1215 right, right now. Now I have 1284. So as more data goes in, more data comes out. So now let's go into our Power BI and let's see what we have there. So we have Power BI. We have this brand new data set. You see the little yellow star by it? That lets us know that it's fairly new. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to just do a very simple, I'm going to do a count. Come on, you know you want to show up. There we go. So I'm just going to do a record count. And 
and I'm going to add a filter to this. Well, let's just say I only want uh, low priority calls. Okay. And now let me go ahead and add a line chart. And what I want is I want in that fashion, right? So let me go ahead and widen this up a little bit. Okay, let me go ahead and save this. We'll call it my report. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and pin this to my new dashboard, my dashboard. I want to pin this to my dashboard too because I'm just in a pinning mood. So let's go to my dashboard. Here we have some things, right? So let's slide you over, slide you over, drag you across. And you notice how things are actually moving? So let me go ahead, total calls. So let me go ahead and pin this as a visual. And let's try it down here because it's... So as you can see, we're streaming data. This is a live dashboard. This dashboard is changing every second. Depending on the organization, depending on the use case, depending on a variety of elements, this is this may be an, an extremely useful implementation or configuration of a streaming analytics to be able to get operational reporting. Um, imagine, if you will, a manufacturing, right? Um, you know, you're trying or call centers, right? You're trying to determine whether you need the same number of resources every day. And maybe what can happen is maybe you can use a variety of vectors to be able to determine whether you need to keep someone longer or not based on what you see trending, right? Uh, imagine Samsung's call center uh, over the last month and a half, um, whether if they were able to see a trend about exploding phones, they'd probably be using something like this. You know, we need all hands on deck. We need to bring a, you know, a whole third shift needs to play first shift because we need that many number of people to handle all the calls coming in. You know, and they'll be able to see those numbers right away. They'll be able to see the decline. They'll be able to see the incline. They'll be able to see how things have transformed over time. And again, this is this is just Power BI, right? I'm doing nothing special. Um, you know. So with that said, let's go back to our slide deck. Here's some helpful information. Some things that can most definitely help provide um, some more insights, especially about SAQL or some SAQL query patterns. So when you start dealing with some of the windowing functions, especially the sliding window, there might be some use cases that, that might elude you, and they've got some pretty good examples in this location uh, to be able to determine what's the best use case and how to be able to leverage that. And with that said, that's all I got for you. I hope, I hope this was uh, well worth your time. Hopefully you're able to get some insights. Um, you know, now I'd say let's open it up to questions and see if anyone has any questions out there. All right, Warren, we don't quite yet have any questions, but we'll give it another minute or two, see if anyone uh, has, oh, here we go. That's always the cue for people to start asking questions. One moment here. All right, got a, a question here. How can you see calls for the last 10 seconds? So if I wanted to see what's happened over the last 10 seconds, I would change my query. So I would first have to stop my streaming analytics job. So I'll go ahead and do that, and that is much faster than anything else that we've done so far. So if we go here, click on the job itself, we tell it to stop. So what I would do is when it's done stopping, which should be here in a few seconds, You would go to your query. Let's see if it'll let me go in there. And ultimately, what I would want is if I wanted 10 seconds, I'd make this one and 10. If I wanted 10 minutes, right? I wanted hours, years, days. So I would make that a 10, and then I would also have to make this a 10. 
because, again, the windowing configuration for a specific streaming analytics job needs to match for every component of that individual query. If you needed to have one that's 10 <coughs> seconds and one that's one second, you would have two separate streaming analytics jobs. That answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, let's see here. We got another one. Is it possible to see how data looks like in the event hub? So the way to look at data in the event hub, I, that, that I've not done. Believe it or not, it's essentially what we're doing here with streaming analytics, right? We're reading the data from the event hub and we're bringing everything in. So if we really wanted to see everything that's inside the event hub, we would do is we would write a right from our WS event hub input and then push it out somewhere. And everything that lands there is what's inside the event hub. All right. All right, next question. Is there a sandbox where people can try this? Uh, sandbox is your Azure. Get your free subscription for 30 days, hop on there and start playing around. Um, event Hub, you will configure, when you configure the Event Hub, you're configuring partitions and you're just configuring how much data and how long to retain it. It goes to a, to a storage, uh, some kind of storage mechanism. You'll need to uh, define a storage account for it. You define your, define your Event Hub and then just get your streaming analytics and then you're able to choose your source and your output. In this case, your source is your, your input is your event hub. You just need something to feed the event hub, which ultimately is this application here, which I'm going to stop. And what I can do, if, if, if you'd like, is I can make the slide deck. I can also make that telco app that I've built available to you so you can go ahead and, and take a look at it and play with it. What I will make sure happens is that it doesn't use my shared key for my object, my subscri subscription, so you have to make sure you change those attributes that I pointed out, right? You have to change this value here as well as this information here, right? This, this value key here. Those two value keys would need to be changed to match your subscription, but I can give you this app so you'd be able to generate it, or you can just, you know, use anything else that you'd like. If you've got applications that are already writing to an event hub, um, you know, just go ahead and, and use that. Okay. And then, uh, uh, on the follow-up on that 10-second one, is there a way that you can have a Power BI tile that's pinned up that shows an increasing number, but it only shows the last 10 seconds worth of data in that in that tile? So in this case, you want a you want to go to the tile and let's see, just edit the report. So what we'd want and let's just say this tile here, right? You only want the last 10 seconds. What you might be able to do is put time as a filter. And then, uh, let's see, you want advanced filtering. And where is, right? And use your logic here, right? Where it's less than or equal to or greater than now minus 10 seconds. All right. And there's a question about when the recording will be available. Uh, usually I get the recordings posted within a week of the initial uh, webinar, provided nothing goes wrong with the uh, recording itself. There is an output that's named WS Power BI Archive. What does that do? Gotcha, 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 gotcha. So you know what, let's, uh, let's go ahead and show that. So this, this, this output that I created was Power BI Archive. To be able to make that relevant, I need to create a new <coughs> table in my Azure database. So now I've created a new table called Power BI Archive with a particular specific schema. There it is there. And now inside my, I'm gonna, I have a query already that I pre-built. And again, it's going to have to change that to match the windowing functions, but I'll leave it at one second because everything should be there. So I'm copying this as SQL, and I'm going to go here and paste it. I want to make these all still one second because I don't necessarily want to change all of that. Changes have been made, yes. So now what will happen is, is what I've chosen to do is I want to archive what's being shown inside Power BI. 
So I don't want the data that I'm pushing to Power BI to only exist in the Power BI data set. I want it to exist somewhere else so I can potentially do other aggregations, uh, such as additional historical training or leverage this information in other ways. So to be able to do that, I've got this now new output, Power BI Archive, which if you notice, it's a mirror of what I'm pushing to Power BI. And then when I start my job, it will actually start writing to that third output. So I'm going to start it. I don't suggest we all, you know, sit down and wait for it. But what will end up happening is that we'll start getting data appearing inside this table. Okay. Once the job starts. And as we know, the job will take about 30 seconds to two minutes to start. So. Okay. Can you put multiple um, queries, like tumbling window, sliding window, into a single job, or do they have to be separate jobs? They have to be separate jobs. Okay. Um. Can you use streaming analytics to collect data from a source database? So the source database needs to push the information to one of three one of three areas, right? It needs to push it to an event hub, needs to push the data to an IoT hub, or needs to push the data to a blob storage. If you can write the component to get the data from your source system to one of those three locations, streaming analytics can pull that data out. Okay. So if what you're thinking of doing is something along the lines of a change data capture, right? And let's say you wanted the source database to use change data capture and you want change data capture content to be displayed as real-time data um, using streaming analytics, you've got to find a way to get that change data capture content to be pushed out to one of these three available sources. If you want to use streaming analytics as your mode of, of aggregating and pushing out in the quote-unquote near real-time functionality. All right. Great. Um, I think I hit all of the questions that are out there. There's a couple comments in here, Warren, that I'll get over to you uh, from Phil. Okay. Uh, but beyond that, I think we are done for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, here for joining today.